I'm going to show you how to go from this into that. Welcome to OGL Dev. My name is Itai Meiri. Today, we're finally going to talk about 3D. Our world, the physical world, is obviously three-dimensional. Every object has a width, a height, and some depth to it. In addition to that, our eyes pick up the sense of distance to objects really well. As objects are further away from us, they appear to be smaller, and vice versa. We expect 3D games to behave in the same way. The problem is that if we take two identical triangles and we provide them with different Z values, when we render them, they still have the same size on the screen. Try that. Changing their size to match the distance simply doesn't happen automatically. It is our job to do it. So how do we do it? Well, let's see what we're already capable of. We know how to load vertices into vertex buffers and render them as triangles. Each vertex has a position coordinate with x, y, and z components, and uh, we even have a provision for a fourth component, w. Remember that I told you that we will need it for 3D and perspective projection? Well, today is the day. In order for a vertex to be rendered, we need its x and y components to be within the minus 1 to 1 range. Otherwise, the rasterizer will simply clip it away. We can manipulate the position in the vertex shader, and we saw a few transformations for doing that. Translation, rotation, and scaling. The problem is that once that vertex has reached the rasterizer, it's a done deal. We cannot change the x and y at this point. The rasterizer will simply render the triangle based on the x and y of the three vertices. He doesn't know what to do with the z value. Well, that's not entirely true because we use the z value for depth testing to decide which triangle is in front of the other, but um, that topic will have to wait. In order to achieve the illusion of 3D, we have to do something in the vertex shader that will tweak the x and y components of the three vertices so that the triangle will appear to be bigger or smaller based on their distance from the camera. This transformation is called perspective projection. Now let's dive into the details. I want to start by introducing you to a very important concept called the view frustum. This is basically the visible part of the 3D world. Same as in the real world, we cannot see stuff behind our back. As we look further away, we can capture a larger part of our environment. We don't want to model the human eye too precisely because it will simply make our calculations much more complex and the benefit will probably, probably not be that great. After all, we are rendering into a rectangular window and our vision is uh, clearly not rectangular. So we are using this view frost um, as a simplified model. Everything inside the frostum will be rendered in our window and everything else will be partially or completely clipped away. The frostum itself has four sides that represent the extent of the viewable volume of space in terms of the horizontal and vertical width. These are basically part of geometric planes and we call them clip planes because everything that cuts through them is clipped. They have names. We have a top and bottom clip plane and a left and right clip plane. In addition to that, we have a couple of more clip planes, near and far. These two deserve a bit of explanation. The thing is that our eyes are not limited in terms of the distance to the light origin. We can see stars that are light years away if their light is bright enough. In the case of a 3D application, we want to capture the Z value of each pixel in something called a depth buffer and we don't want to deal with very large numbers because of all the numerical issues that such numbers introduce. Another reason is that we want to reduce the amount of compute required to render the scene and by clipping away objects that are far away from the user, we help reduce the load on the system. In the view frustum, we use the far clip plane in order to limit the maximum distance to the triangles that can be rendered. And in every application, you will need to give some thought about where you set your far clip plane. This will affect the way the user will perceive the environment in terms of the distance to the horizon, as well as the precision of the depth buffer, which can get you into problems called the Z-fighting. More on this in a future video. As we will soon see, the reason for the near clip plane is also mathematical. We will need to include division by the Z-value in the projection procedure and if it is too small, it might get ugly. Why do we need the view frostum? In addition to clipping out stuff outside of the scene, the frostum also helps us map pixels from the virtual 3D world to actual pixels on the screen for the rasterizer. 
The rasterizer needs three coordinates with x and y in the range of minus one to one. Let's take a 3D coordinate, for example, uh, this one here, and uh, draw a line from that point to the camera, which is located at the origin. Since this point is inside the frost term, the line must cross the near clip plane at some location. If we set the near clip plane to go from minus one by minus one at the bottom left to one by one at the top right, then the intersection point between the line and the near clip plane is exactly the coordinate that we need to specify to the rasterizer in order to render the original 3D point. Basically, we're mapping or projecting the point onto the near clip plane. If we project three vertices, the rasterizer can now render a full triangle. Let's see how this helps us achieve the illusion of 3D. We still need to talk about the camera, but for now, let's assume for simplicity that the camera is located at the origin of the coordinate space and it is looking straight down along the positive z value. So in this diagram, we're looking at the world from the side onto the yz plane. We take two identical tall boxes and we place them at different distances from the camera. Now let's draw lines from the top of each box to the origin and obviously we can see that even though the boxes are identical, the intersection points are different. If we use this method to render all the triangles of the two boxes, we will see that the closer box appears to be larger than the one which is more distant. We have accomplished the illusion of 3D. All that remains is to calculate the intersection point. But before we do that, we need to discuss another important concept, the field of view. We now know that we need to map any 3D coordinate to some point on the near clip plane, and that this plane matches the rasterizer range in the x and y axis, that is from minus one to one. In this diagram, I've placed the near clip plane at a distance of one from the origin on the z axis. It is very easy to see that in, in this case, the top and bottom planes of the view frustum are at 45 degrees from the z-axis. This means that we have a 90, 90 degrees angle between the top and the bottom planes. We call this number the vertical field of view. We can move the near clip plane away from the origin, which will effectively decrease the vertical field of view. What this does is that it decreases the viewable vertical range. So, we're mapping a smaller range of the 3D space to the same window. The final result is that the objects will appear to be larger. This is more commonly known as zooming in. We can also move the near clip plane closer to the origin, which will effectively increase the vertical field of view. So now we need to uh, kind of cram a larger range into the same number of pixels. As you've probably already guessed, this means zooming out. The exact same thing can be done with the horizontal field of view, so I'm gonna skip it. You will need to set the vertical and horizontal field of view angles according to the requirements of your game or uh, application. The rule of thumb here is that the ratio between them should match the ratio between the window height and width. Otherwise, the image will appear to be stretched uh, one way or the other. Now it's time to calculate the location of the projected 3D point on the near clip plane. Notice that all 3D points along the line from our point to the origin are going to be projected on the same location. They may differ from each other in terms of uh, color and we will need to make sure that the rasterizer renders only the closest 3D point. We do this using depth testing, um, more on this later. We want the user to control the field of view. So in general, let's call this angle alpha and we can actually divide alpha into two halves, above and below the Z axis. Since the field of view is configurable, the distance to the near clip plane is denoted as D. We can calculate D using the tangents trig function. Okay, so tangents of uh, half of alpha equals to one divided by D. So we can extract D and that equals to 1 divided by the tangents of half of alpha. Given the red point, which has a 3D position x, y, and z, we want to find the location of the green point, which is the projection on the near clip plane. We don't care about the x at this stage because uh, we're looking at it from the side. We will do a similar trick from the top and calculate the x in the exact same way. Right now, we're focusing on yp. The z value of the green point is obviously d, same as the near clip plane. 
we can see that we have two similar triangles. This is one triangle over here, and this is the second triangle. The fact that they are similar provides us with the following ratio. yp divided by d equals to y divided by z, which means that uh, yp equals to y multiplied by d divided by z. And uh, we know that uh, d equals to 1 divided by tangents of half of alpha, so finally yp equals to y divided by z times the tangents of half of alpha. So we've found the projected y-coordinate, and finding the projected x-coordinate is exactly the same. This time we're looking from the top down at the xz plane. The vertical field of view angle is again alpha, because we're using a square cl uh, near clip plane to match the rasterizer range of coordinates. We'll take care of the aspect ratio later. So we have the same equation to calculate the distance to the near clip plane d. The equation that calculates uh, xp is the same as the one for the yp, we just need to replace uh, x and y all over the place, okay? So xp now divided by d equals to x divided by z, and we can extract xp, which equals to x multiplied by d divided by z, again replace d with uh, 1 divided by the tangents of uh, half of alpha, so finally xp equals to x divided by z, times the tangents of half of alpha. We found the two equations that allows us to calculate the coordinate that the rasterizer needs to render, and theoretically, we could have implemented this directly in our vertex shader. After all, the 3D coordinate is given to us, and the tangents of half of the field of view angle can and uh, should be calculated once outside the shader and provided to the shader as a uniform. The problem with this approach is that this extra compute is a waste of precious uh, GPU cycles. We can simply create yet another matrix. Let's call it the projection matrix. We will multiply this matrix last. That is, first we will apply the scaling, rotation, and translation matrices, and finally the projection matrix. This is because this matrix calculates the actual coordinates that the rasterizer needs, so we don't want to add any more transformations after the projection matrix. Now let's see how we can create this matrix. And here we run into a problem. It's very easy to construct a matrix that will multiply x and y by 1 divided by the tangents of half of alpha, but um, look at the equations on the right hand side. We still need to divide both x and y by the z value, but there is simply nothing that we can put into the projection matrix that will divide by a component of the vector that is multiplied by this matrix. Remember that this matrix will be generated once and then used to transform multiple position vectors. Now the 3D pipeline architects were fully aware of this problem and the idea that they came up with was to add a fixed function stage in the rasterizer that will take the gl underscore position vector that is coming out of the vertex shader and divide it by the w component. So uh, you may ask yourself, why divide by w? Why not simply divide by z? And I guess the reason is that we are going to add some additional transformation to this matrix for the z value. I'm not going to go into this right now, because uh, this is the main topic for the next tutorial, but the idea is, is that uh, once the z is transformed, its original value is lost, so there is no point in dividing by the transformed z. The trick is to copy the original z value into w, and then the rasterizer will divide by w, which of course contains the z, so we are actually dividing by z. This stage is called perspective division, and um, it cannot be turned off. We haven't noticed it so far in the previous tutorial, simply because we made sure to put 1 in the w, so it had no effect, but uh, believe me, uh, it was there. As you can see, the whole system of 3D in OpenGL is a delicate combination of uh, software and hardware. In your vertex shader, you need to multiply your vertices by the projection matrix. This matrix contains only part of the projection equation. The projection is complete when we go through the perspective division in the rasterizer. And to make this part work, we have to copy the z value 
into the W component of the GL underscore position variable. This is very simple to do using the following line in the projection matrix. Since this is the fourth row, the result of a dot product of this row and the vector go into the W component in the final result. And if you do the dot product with the vector on the right hand side, you get Z. I label this as a temporary projection matrix because it represents just what we have learned uh, so far. In the next video, we will expand it with the aspect ratio and the Z transformation. Right now, the Z is copied to the result, same as the W, but uh, it doesn't really matter. Now, let's take a look at the code that uh, implements all of this. Okay, so this tutorial is heavily based on the previous one, the index draws. So uh, make sure you watch that if you need more uh, details on the implementation. I'm, not, I'm just uh, going to show the, the changes that I've made to create the, this demo. Okay, so the first thing here is that um, we're rendering a cube. And to do that, I exported the cube from Blender into a text file and I took out the positions as well as the indices and placed them directly here. Okay, so I'm using the vertex structure that I added in the previous tutorial and the only change that I've made here is to add the Z component in the, um, in the constructor. Okay, previously we didn't care about the Z at all because it was just, uh, you know, without any depth, just uh, 2D. So it was uh, initialized to zero here, but now we need the Z. So uh, we have it here and we initialize the position using X, Y, Z. And um, same as in the previous tutorial, the color is randomized, okay? So each time you run this, you get a different color. Now here, we have an array of eight vertices for the cube. And here's the position, the coordinates, the position coordinates that I got from uh, Blender. There is no change in the initialization of the vertex buffer. And here's the indices, again, directly copied from uh, Blender. And here we initialize the element array buffer, the index buffer. But to make this work, uh, I uh, had to make a few changes to the OpenGL state which I did in the main function. So here they are. I had to enable face culling. Now I discussed uh, face culling in a previous tutorial, not exactly remembered uh, which one. So I'll put, I'll check it later and put the link uh, below. But uh, without face culling, um, both of the, the sides of, the, of each triangle are rendered and then the, the cube looks funny. So, um, so when you, so when you have a closed uh, mesh, you need to enable uh, face culling so you will only render the exterior of the mesh and not the triangles that are pointing into inside of it, okay? So enable GL cull face and also we need to tell OpenGL that the front facing triangles are clockwise. Now the default is usually counterclockwise. I guess you can configure it uh, probably in Blender in some way, but uh, I didn't investigate it. So I just checked uh, which direction worked and uh, this one uh, worked. So clockwise, and then we tell OpenGL to call the back facing uh, triangles. Okay, so only front facing triangles, the ones that are pointing out of the cube are uh, rendered. Now the rest of the changes are in the um, render callback function at the top. So let's uh, check it. Uh, we have three matrices here. Okay, rotation, translation, and projection. The rotation is the regular rotation uh, matrix that you're already familiar with. I'm using the scale here, which is uh, incremented on every call just to make the, uh, the cube spin around. And um, the translation and let's start with the identity, okay? So um, we don't have any, tr any translation at this point. And the projection matrix is also the identity matrix, okay? So now in order to calculate the final matrix for the shader, we start by the rotation, and then we have translation followed by projection. So right now the translation and projection matrices are the identity uh, matrices, so uh, we don't expect them to have any effect. And uh, here we place, we send the, uh, the matrix, the final matrix into the shader as a uniform, and the rest is the same as the previous uh, tutorial, so uh, I won't go into many details here. The only change is that you need to make sure 
is to render the correct number of uh, vertices. And since we have 12 triangles for the cubes, we need 36 indices, okay? So now let's run this. And we can see that uh, it appears to be a cube, but there is no depth and no, uh, uh, it just no perspective projection. It just doesn't, uh, doesn't look right, okay? So what we need to do is to initialize the projection matrix, same as we saw in the uh, background section. So I've initialized the field of view to be 90 degrees, and then we need to calculate the tangents of half of uh, the field of view. So take the field of view, divide it by two to get the half. Next, we need to call tan f, which is uh, a C library function to calculate the tangents function, but you cannot just plug in the angle in degrees. You need to convert it to radians. So for that, we have a handy macro in OGL dev math 3D. So here's the, uh, the function to translate from uh, degrees to radian. You can just uh, find it uh, online. And now when we have the tangents of half of the field of view, uh, we can divide, we can actually take the reciprocal. Uh, I just called it uh, F here. And now we can put it in the projection matrix in the correct location. Okay, so we have the same value here and here. And also we talked about uh, the need to copy the, double, the, the Z into the W component. So for that, we need to change this to one and then this to zero. Okay, so when you do a dot product of this uh, vector by x, y, z, w, because of the one multiplied by the z, you will get the w. And now when we run this, we can see that we are not seeing anything. And the reason is that once you start uh, playing with the projection matrix, you need to make sure to move the object uh, away from the camera because of all the uh, the stuff about the Z copied into the W and then the perspective uh, division. Okay, so let's uh, put, uh, for example, three here. And now we can see the cube. Uh, if we put uh, one, it will be closer, much closer. Okay, and uh, if, uh, if we can put in a hundred, and then you can barely see it in the distance. Okay, let's change it to 10. And uh, we can still see it. So now using the projection matrix, when we change the value of Z, it affects the X and the Y that reach the rasterizer. So we're getting a bigger or smaller triangle based on the value of Z. Now, if we go back to the original projection matrix, which was just the identity. And we run this like that with 10 added to the Z value. Now we're not seeing anything. And the reason is that the rasterizer clips away vertices with Z value above uh, one. So when you're not using a projection matrix, you need to make sure that the Z values are between minus one and one. For example, if we put in minus one here, then we're still seeing something. Okay, so we'll talk uh, more about this in the next tutorial. So we're not done with perspective projection just yet. We still need to take care of the aspect ratio and the transformation of the Z value. All this will be covered in the next video. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it useful. If you did, please like the video and subscribe to my channel. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you for watching and uh, I will see you soon.